I want to thank everyone from Renaissance Society, the community and Eventbrite for joining us today for Christina Richter's talk, The Place They Called Junction. Christina is, um, has become a very good friend. She is an excellent, excellent historian. She serves with me on a number of other uh, committees, including the Conference of California Historical Societies. She has a new job with the uh, Placer County um, Museum. I'm gonna get that one wrong. Uh, she has served on the Placer uh, uh, County Historical Society. She is also on the Sacramento Historical Society Board very, very active. One of the things I really wanna thank her for is that we're here in Sacramento. We get very Sacramento centric. So it's wonderful for her to be able to share the story of something that's so close and yet in some ways seems so far. I'm gonna throw it over to you now, Christina. Uh, again, just a reminder that if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll be able to have you ask your question in person and in the chat after she does her talk. Christina, thank you. Oh, thank you, Mary Ellen. I'll be so happy when we get to meet in person again. <laughs> and it looks like it may happen by the end of the year. I just, uh, I love the audience and I, I love the interaction, but for now this will have to do. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and welcome everybody for this, this presentation on this place called Junction. And as Mary Ellen said, I'm pretty active here locally in history. I feel like, you know, history is what, when you know, a community knows their history, it really makes a difference of a, between a place you just live in and a place you love. And to me, when we know our history and we know how all of our areas are interconnected, Sacramento, Roseville, Auburn, El Dorado, then we appreciate and love our community even more. Um, I am the immediate past president of the Roseville Historical Society. I spent about 10 years there, and I did write a book in the, in the middle of all of that about a pioneer family called the Fitiments. I am at Placer County Museums. I do serve on the Historical Advisory Board now for Placer County, and that's fun, because when there's history things going on around here, I get all of the inside scoop. So let's talk about Roseville. This was a place where not a lot was going on except we had a lot of Native Americans here. A lot of Native Americans who lived amongst all of these wonderful oak trees that used to be here, all of the, the animals. They knew how to create a life out of just naked land. Now this is an exhibit um, it's an outdoor exhibit. And what I want you to imagine is, yeah, you see the, the mortar holes, you see the pestles, but the Indians actually created baskets with holes in the bottom that they would put inside of these mortar holes and it would enable them to either pour hot water in, to grind even more acorns and to do a lot more work. So when you see these, these grinding rocks as they call them in and around, Think of it as a little bit more than just a hole in the ground because they actually made tools that would fit in here and accommodate. Of course, we had our Spanish rule, 1769 to 1790, and we had 21 missions total. They were a day's ride from each other. So we weren't really affected too much here in Placer County. They were mostly along the coast, some inland. But of course, their job was to tame the Native American, if you will, and to convert them to Christianity. After our missions, of course, we had the Mexican land grants. And you'll notice Placer County up here, we didn't have any Mexican land grants either. So we didn't have any missions. We didn't have any land grants. And the Native Americans continued to live here pretty much undisturbed. And this was 1834 to 1847. And of course, we didn't really know where these land grants were. They were rudely and crudely outlined with a pen and paper or pencil and paper. So this is the first documentation of our land that we had. And I, I love looking at these because they're talking about the animals and the ridges and the actual waterways. These are neat documents if you get a hold of them and you see them. 1840s is when it really started to change. The ranchers, the uh, 
Mexican land grants enabled ranchers to go crazy with their cattle. And of course they sold their cattle for fur and tallow or their hides and tallow primarily. And then our fur trappers came. Now the interesting thing about the fur trappers is they are actually the ones who first introduced disease to these Native Americans. And in fact, it, it affected more Native Americans than anything else did. Not a lot of people know that, but these fur trappers, they were um, not necessarily prolific, but they were very destructive to the Native Americans. And of course, we all know John Sutter, and he established um, himself here at about 1839, and then he built his fort in 1841. This is a rendering, an early on rendering. Of course, he had his big wall around the fort, and he was seen as a welcome person who was settling the land at the time. Another thing was going on and it was called Manifest Destiny. And this was this feeling that we had a God-given right to explore these lands and settle them and develop them. That's how we landed on the East Coast. That's how we continued to go West. And then of course, California and the Western Coast, that was the final frontier. And before that, as I said, it was primarily fur trappers and traders that were west of the Mississippi. Hopefully you've all seen this wonderful painting. This was a painting uh, by John Gast. It was done in 1872. He actually was commissioned to do it for a traveler's brochure. This is Columbia and she represents the United States. And you see she's coming from the light, which is behind her, which is representative of the East. And she's going to the dark, which is the West and she's bringing light with her. She's holding a school book. She has all the settlers following her. And you see the Native Americans actually leaving as she comes forward in her path. So at this point in time, the United States really, really wants California. So we are in the middle of the Mexican-American War, June of 1846 to January of 1847. And we all know what else was going on then as a result of Manifest Destiny. We had a, a fairly large party of immigrants stuck in the Sierra Nevada called the Donners. Of course, that's another story. But because this Mexican-American War was going on, we couldn't get to them right away. It was hard to rescue them, which was a big part of their problem. But again, that's another story. So Mexico finally cedes to the United States in February of 1848. But the funny thing was, in January, the month before, gold was discovered. And if it were modern day, it would have been tweeted out immediately and they wouldn't have given up the country. So in January of 1848, gold was discovered and the rush was on. It was the largest voluntary mass migration in history and it continues to be so to this day. So California became an, uh, a state very early on, uh, September 9th, 1850, and we were the 31st state. All right, so let's focus into California itself. Um, these were the early, yes, we do have plaster on there. These were the early counties. Um, there was actually one before this, but I, I skipped that and went straight to this one because Placer County was actually carved out from Sutter and Yuba counties. It's about 100 miles long. As you know, the terrain is so diverse and 10 to 30 miles wide. And Placer County, that means gold. And there we are. And this again is a hand-drawn map. And I just love this. And you can see how we were all divided up there. So we didn't have a lot of people here in the beginning because there wasn't anything here. The Native Americans eventually left, although we did cohabitate with them for quite a while. And what we had here were farmers and ranchers in the 1850s and 60s. Some came as a result of the gold rush and turned to other things. And some came for the actual opportunity of what the land would bring them. We had three major districts Pleasant Grove, Dry Creek, and the area called Near Town, which is Citrus Heights at this point. 
So the names that you're going to hear me talking about for a minute are Fidiment, Kaysburg, Shellhouse, Dudley, Gould, Astle, Kirby, and Doyle. And I want to make one thing very clear. Kaysburg is not the Kaysburg from the Donner Party. In fact, that was Keysburg. And this guy is a totally different guy, James William Kaysburg. So George Kirby, he came here for the gold rush and he didn't quite make it in the mines. And he came into the area and said, this is going to be a good area for me to do some cattle ranching. He originally was doing uh, freighting as a, a mine teamster when he didn't make it in the mines. And then he decided that cattle ranching was the right thing for him to do. The Kirby brothers, he had so many children. They became a very important cattle producer here in California. And then Jack Doyle, he arrived in 1860 from Canada of all places, and he took up farming directly. That was his specialty. And this, if you live in Roseville or know about Roseville, that uh, Folsom Road, including the Roseville Square Shopping Center was his land. And then of course his son, Bill Doyle, He's the one who began the Roseville Telephone Company back in 1913. And Doyle did not come here for the gold rush. I believe I mentioned that. The other guys, Shellhouse, Dudley, Gould, and Astle. Don't you love these spaces? So Shellhouse, he came as a result of the gold rush, didn't make it. 1852, decided he was going to go into cattle ranching. And his ranching empire actually continued until 1960. I went out to see their old ranch a couple of years ago. They're developing it now. It was uh, kind of eerie to walk on the land with the old, the old barn and where you knew everything used to be. And then Dudley, uh, he bought a squatter's claim. Um, and then he decided to buy two, or he gr got granted 320 acres. This is before homesteading was going on. And then by 1978, he had amassed 710 acres. Gould, who's a neighbor to Shell House, he was into farming and grain. And then Astle, one of our earlier, earlier pioneers, was here first on a federal grant purchase, and they were into farming. And then the last two, the only woman of the bunch, and by the way, this is the family I wrote the story about. Uh, she came here in 1855, 56. Uh, actually, she came to Rio Vista in 1853 as a widow, and she remarried and then came out to this area in 1855. She had remarried, um, had five more children, became a massive landowner. The speculations are she had over 20,000 acres of land actually go through her accounts, if you will, because she bought and sold land all the time. Her son, Walter Fidiment, from her first marriage, he's the one that carried on the land empire and actually built the house in West Roseville that still stands. And then we go to James Kaysburg, and he was a German immigrant. So you see, these people are coming from all over, from Canada, from different parts of the United States, from Germany. Kaysburg was immensely, immensely um, successful, 50,000 acres, and he hung on to his land. And he's the one who actually built an incredible mansion in 1892, and that still stands in Roseville. So here's, I'm gonna put my glasses on now because the print's getting a little small. <laughs> so here's Pleasant Grove District. And this district was important because the immigrants flowed through here to the mines. And this was also a place where a lot of the Native Americans were residing. And then you can see the gold mines over here all along the American River. Sutter's Fort is here. Here's Sacramento City. So this is early, early on when this area finally began to become settled. The problem that these ranchers and farmers had, of course, is it was a 12 hour one way trip to Sacramento. And Sacramento was the place where they had to, to sell their goods. So 
they had to encounter along this 12 hour one way trip, highway men, and the roads were very seasonal. So sometimes it would take longer, sometimes it wasn't quite so long, but those roads were a mess. You can um, be sure of that. We needed better transportation. So the first railroad, and this is a, another story as well. The railroad out here is, um, it's one of romance, it's one of adventure, it's one of going forward in a, a technological way that hadn't happened before. I think this is akin to our space program, frankly, the railroads. So the first one, was from Sacramento to Folsom, and that was the Sacramento Valley Railroad. And that was a very, very exciting adventure. Um, Folsom was originally Negro Bar, and it eventually became Folsom through land grants and that sort of thing. The next area uh, we have that goes from Folsom to Gritter's Ranch, and then it was going to go on to Lincoln. And this was called the California Central Railroad. And what it really was, was the Sacramento Valley Railroad in a new iteration, because that particular railroad had some financial issues, um, got it closed down, reopened a new company, and called it the California Central. Now here's the guy behind those two railroads, Theodore Judah. He's the engineer that was brought out here specifically for that Sacramento Valley Railroad. And then he uh, expanded and then he knew he had a dream and the dream was much bigger than those two railroad lines. It was getting over the Sierra Nevada, the Transcontinental Railroad. And he partnered with the big four, we all know them, Hopkins, Crocker, Huntington and Stanford. And he, along with those four, continued to lobby for this railroad. And of course, President Lincoln knew Theodore Judah, knew of his capability, and also he had a war going on and he needed some allies here in the West. So in 1862, the Pacific Railroad Act was, was created in Colin Calls P. Huntington was back uh, in Washington at the time, and he telegraphed, we have drawn the elephant. Now let us see if we can harness him up. It was a very exciting time. So treasury loans were created. For each mile in the flat plains, these railroads would get, these railroad companies, we get 16,000, and in the Great Basin, it was 32,000 and the mountains were 48,000. And if you don't know the story, the big four hired a surveyor to claim that the mountains began seven miles outside of Sacramento. So that of course put a few more pennies in their pocket. This is Roseville, and there are a couple of pictures like this, and they have a team of um, mule, donkey here, and they're grading. And this was a local effort. There were no unions at that time. The locals wanted this railroad very badly, so they were grading and they helped lay the railroad ties all along the route. So here we have the beginning of the Central Pacific Railroad going from Sacramento to Gritter's Ranch. And Gritter's Ranch, of course, had the California Central already there, so they crossed, crossed paths. And on the railroad maps, this was called the junction. Not on this particular one, but on many railroad maps right here is where it happened. So from 1856 to 1867, there was a lot of building going on. And consequently, they tore down a lot of trees because there's a lot of building buildings happening. Uh, the railroad ties required massive trees. And just as a side note, when you do drive through Placer County, especially in this area, and you see what they call valley oaks with the multiple trunked oaks, those are from an original oak tree, which had a huge base to it that was cut down. And they're such hardy trees that they re-sprouted, if you will. I've seen second and third growth oak trees, and it just is amazing to me that they are so hardy and they've been here for hundreds and hundreds of years. This was the original map of Roseville, and here is the junction. 
right here. And this was just a dream that was drawn up. And it was drawn up in 1864. So pretty early on and the streets were labeled. Well, a few of the streets were labeled. We have Atlantic and Pacific and Lincoln and Washington, uh, your typical East West couple of presidents. And they pretty much knew how they wanted to build the city, especially around the railroad and the waterway. And this is how Roseville grew up and how it became a town on both sides of the railroad track. So here's the, the uh, notation zoomed in, filed this 13th day of August, 1864, uh, O.D. Lombard, and we have our recorder's signature on here. The Governor Stanford, this is the first engine to run along that railroad that went into junction. And you can imagine massive, massive machine and blowing smoke and very, very noisy. It just completely disrupted the entire countryside, but it was, it was done in a, a very welcome way. So you see the CPRR there, the Central Pacific Railroad. One of our, or not one of, the very first store was at Atlantic and Lincoln Streets. And this is kind of fun. You've got your post office, you have your plows, you have your bakery, you have your groceries. Everything could be found in this store for quite a few years. Now, the one thing that a lot of people don't know is what that star means right up here in the middle. And if you were a live audience, I'd be asking you <laughs> if anyone knows what that means. Well, we did a little digging at the Placer County Museums and we found out that the star was actually a symbol of the early farmers for good luck. So this particular building was built and that star was placed there. And as the businesses began to do business in there, they put their other signs out. I loved that tidbit when we learned it. Here's another early store that would be Brandstetter. And here's Mr. Brandstetter himself. These are the early merchants of the day. Now keep in mind, those that were here um, and didn't make it in the mines, a lot of them did turn to ranching and farming, but a lot of them also went back to what they did back home if they didn't go back home. And Brandstetter was one of those. He knew how to run a store. And sure enough, he opened this Typical Roseville looking store. And the one thing I wanna point out to you is the boards right in front of the walkway here. And you can kind of make out some writing. Well, what these were used for was early day advertising. And oftentimes they would advertise something that maybe they weren't really supposed to be selling. And I'm gonna jump forward just for a, uh, jump forward in time just for a reference. 1902, so we're a little bit further in time, but this was a, a big cat shot out on the foot of ranch and they brought it into town and they wanted to show it off. And in so doing, they laid it across this board. And can you make out what it says? It says whiskey. You can see the W here. You can kind of make out the H and the rest of it, but it does say whiskey. And what was happening here is this particular storefront faced the railroad right where people got off. So the gentleman of the day, primarily gentleman of the day would know that whiskey was sold in that particular store. So his, this is how this came to be known as Junction. And I'm gonna read it to you. Brakeman in particular, were not overly impressed with the small community and its small depot. In fact, they would enter junction in their train log books and would emphasize junk when calling out junction upon arrival at the depot. The depot was pretty dilapidated up until 1874 and the area wasn't too well maintained. And uh, the new depot in 1874 did a lot to resolve all of that. And then the San Francisco uh, San Francisco gave orders that they were to cease that practice immediately. And of course, our wonderful initial historian, Leonard Duke Davis, who's uh, left us, was a wonderful Roseville historian who did a lot of early research. We had our agricultural development along Pacific Street. 
uh, we were a massive trading center for the area farmers and ranchers. Through 1870s, we had a lot of steady development and the Odd Fellows building here in 1878 still stands in Roseville. And here we are an expanded version of that. You can see the Odd Fellows building, you can see Sawtell. This is at the corner of uh, Pacific and Lincoln and currently the Pacific Cafe sits on this site right here. But this is what it looked like in early Roseville. And this was a very important part of town. And from here, it began to expand to Main Street, to Church Street, to this side of Lincoln. This was a very important part, um, but we still didn't have the main terminus for the railroad yet. So here's what was happening in Placer County at that time. Uh, oranges, olives and olive oil. And if you are a Placer County resident, you may have an olive tree in your backyard. Or you may see some olive trees that are still around. They live for a very long time. As a matter of fact, we have an olive tree in our backyard from a long time ago. So grapes were also prolific here and it wasn't unusual to ship over a million boxes of grapes in a year. And Hence, the winery was established and started operating in 1905. And the winery grew to huge importance and was only second to the railroad here in Roseville. And it operated successfully until Prohibition. And I do hope to be able to give a presentation on our wonderful winery. Uh, William Heyman was hired as our superintendent for that particular venture. And here is the uh, earliest photo that we have of it. One of the walls of this wonderful old building still stands behind the Taylor Street Library. I actually took my daughter to see it the other day. Of course, she uh, <laughs> said, thanks mom, another piece of history. I didn't know I wanted to know. <laughs> they do that to me. This is Mr. William Heyman. He was instrumental in early Roseville in politics and building the community. And of course, he was superintendent of that magnificent winery. So here's Roseville. It's starting to grow. We have the clubhouse being built over here. We have more tracks being laid. Uh, these are the massive railroad yards that began to be built here. And this is the depot in 1907. So one uh, tidbit here is we actually got the railroad from Rockland and that was a big deal because Rockland lost the railroad. It came to Roseville because the big four or not the big four, they were gone, but they needed to expand. And so that's uh, one of the reasons they chose Roseville. There was a couple of other reasons too, but that was a primary, primary one. And here's our train depot in 1907. Our telephone workers, uh, this is not Roseville Telephone Company, this is a prelude to it, and this is right in front of Sawtell's store, and they are working to create the telephone lines that are going to be soon cast about the little city. This is Lincoln Street, 1908. We're starting to grow. We're starting to see these poles coming up. And this is our wonderful West House on Atlantic Street. The West House was originally a hotel and a restaurant. It still stands, of course, as the oldest operating bar in Placer County. And it's a wonderful place to visit. They've done a wonderful job of putting history on display on all of their walls. They have renovated this place several times, but they do honor their history. So here, I, I always think that people are so important. These are the original trustees. So basically our first uh, city council chamber, if you will, important names in Roseville history, Sautel, Thiel, Heyman, there's our Mr. Heyman, Woodbridge and Wells. And their first meeting was April 10th, 1909. Core Woodbridge, of course, we had to have the female balancing out the male influence. She began what was called the Women's Improvement Club. She was also the first woman elected to our state assembly. She was a big deal here in Roseville. She was instrumental in getting the high school built and getting our first library built and basically pretty much cleaning up the town. She and the Women's Improvement Club went to town making sure that we were a proper 
a growing city, if you will. And I always like to end my presentation with this slide. This is a <laughs> turn of the century. We have our ladies in their, their bonnets and they're dressed up because they're planting flowers outside of the depot. And they're quite a proud group. Also, one thing about the Women's Improvement Club, when the Spanish flu hit in 1918, Cora Woodbridge was tasked with helping basically trying to see what they could do in this little town. And there were, I believe it was about 4,000 people at the time and they started dying. And so she immediately went to work with her group and they converted an old boarding house and made it into a makeshift hospital. They treated, uh, I think it was 40, so 40 patients and they lost two. So it was quite the successful venture. And she was, again, just instrumental in this town and its early growth. So with that, I will take questions and see if I can open up my chat here. Christina, thank you so much. If you could do me a favor and stop sharing your screen so we can see you full face, that would be wonderful. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, again, I want to thank you for, um, I, I love these deliciously short talks, by the way. It leaves a lot more room for us for conversation. You know how I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll um, uh, just read from the, the chat first. Uh, a Walker says people in really old photos like that tend to have un, uh, odd, uncomfortable expressions because they had to hold still for so much longer. Um, I think that that is a wonderful say. Uh, uh, somebody asked, you say that Fittiment and Kaysburg mansions are still in Roseville. Are they open for touring or used to be pre-COVID? So the Kaysburg Mansion still stands and it's actually part of a mobile home park and they use it for their clubhouse and they do open it up for touring on occasion. It's fully furnished, it's fully restored, it's, uh, it's beautiful. It looks like it did in its original heyday. The Fitiment home, it's a ranch home, it's not a mansion per se, was doomed to be destroyed and Fortunately, when I was on the uh, board of the Roseville Historical Society, we were able to get it on the Roseville, uh, or excuse me, on the National Register of Historic Places. And then I began in earnest to get it saved. And long story short, we got it uh, stabilized, new roof uh, painted, the windows boarded up, because prior to that, Nobody cared about it. The city had acquired it through a land acquisition because of development. We're hoping that someday it will be open up. I was working with the high school district because the new West Roseville High School is actually built next to it. And I was working with them to maybe make a museum program, a curator program, a farming program, but then COVID hit and I've since moved on. So I'm sure that they're, they're working hard to try and figure out what to do with that building, but it is preserved. So it's not going anywhere, fortunately. Great. And I do invite uh, anyone, Kathy's going to be watching as well, that has a question to feel free to raise your um, hand. Um, I'm going to ask you an odd question, Christina. I'm going to call this the diversity question. I, I noticed um, all of us, when we go to do these early histories, we always have to find a woman. They're, they're not always <laughs> real obvious, I have to say, uh, to talk about, you know, certainly uh, the, the two women that you um, uh, did. But um, it seems awfully white. It was. But, and it was. So, it was. so wh why, I mean, Sacramento, which was always the most diverse, why do you think um, that that's how the population grew there? In not Roseville? In um, yeah. It, I don't think it was intentional. Um, we had a small Chinese population. Of course, Rockland had a huge Chinese population. Right. Uh, Roseville didn't so much. The farmers and the ranchers that came from the east to the west were primarily white. And we were a non-slave state, so they didn't bring their slaves with them. Mm -hmm. The, uh, of course, 
Negro Bar, and it's often called Negro Bar as well. There was a large African American population there. So we had different cultural populations around us other than white, mm -hmm. uh, but not so much in Roseville. And as far as women go, <laughs> when Elizabeth Jane Fidiment came out here as a widow, she had her pick of men because the ratio was about 30 to one oh in Sacramento. God. So she had her pick and women in the mines, oh my goodness, they were just revered. In fact, uh, there are lots of stories of miners throwing parties and some of them dressing up as women just because they wanted to have that kind of a feeling, you know, with the dancing camaraderie and whatever. It was... Um, it's also an opportunistic time for women because they did things that the primarily men miners didn't do, which was cooking and laundry and, and that sort of thing. So they, uh, the ones who were here knew how to make some money, that's for sure. Oh, and I will say this, early Roseville, of course, had its fair share of uh, red light district, if you will. <laughs> As a matter that, that, was, that was my next question. <laughs> I can tell you a great story about that. Um, in the museum, we have this, in the Carnegie Museum, there's this wonderful train display. And uh, we had a wonderful new volunteer and he was used to working on the train tracks and we discovered that it lit up. And that was unusual things lit up lights came on in the in the high school and all these other places in this one building in Roseville had a red light and we thought hmm I wonder interestingly enough the next day now talk about whatever woo woo stuff the woman whose family ran that particular place came in and she said yeah it was a bordello so she actually <laughs> confirmed it for us the day after we learned that the lights came on. So <laughs> great story. And uh, there's actually a lot that's been written about that those early days, but uh, it was pretty discreet, but it was available for sure. Good. So uh, also Marty asked, weren't there any Mexicans that stayed after 1848? Oh, yes, there were. Um, the Basque actually came uh, with, the Basque were in Sacramento, and a lot of the ranchers and farmers would utilize them, um, similar to, and I hate to make this comparison, but it was similar to how you go to Home Depot today, and you are able to get extra workers, but those folks in Sacramento actually were taken in and housed normally, and they were uh, the Basque, and they were very good sheep herders, so yes, we did have some um, Mexican, I guess Basque would be Spain, but yeah, we did have some Mexican um, people in Roseville. What about any Native Americans that stayed in the area, Christina? I don't know of any specifically. I'm okay. sure that there were. They primarily left um, or were, I guess a lot of them were diseased at some point and died. Now, I have heard that there were some descendants of Native Americans, but not any who made a significant difference in the community and growing of Roseville, like in a political way or that sort of thing. Great. And Chris asks, uh, I think he just wants more detail, regarding Cora Woodbridge, was she the first woman from Roseville elected to the State Assembly? And can you tell a little bit more about Oh, sorry. About that, how, anyway, that was his question. So was she ran for office and of course an assembly position is wider than just Roseville. It is an area and she was very good. And she, um, I believe she served two terms and then lost her third term, of course, to a man. But she was articulate. She was um, a very, much of a presence of a woman. There are some films with her. It's a very high voice, and but she commanded attention. And she's also really, really smart. And obviously from her uh, Spanish flu days, she knew how to organize and she knew how to organize quickly. And Janice asked a question. I'm going to uh, ask her question and then ask you to expand on something. Janice says the Mighty Museum is in Roseville. Do they have something on local not uh, Native Americans? And then I'll ask the follow-up question. Um, you know, I was in the Maidu Museum before COVID. 
and I'm not recalling in my mind's eye anything. So I don't know if off the top of my head. So I work for Placer County Museums. Um, Maidu belongs to Roseville, the Maidu Museum does. And Placer County Museums are um, seven different museums um, from Forest Hill to Colfax to Dutch uh, Flat and several in, in Auburn itself. So Maidu isn't under our purview. Um, that's a good question. I don't recall it specifically. I think if I would have seen it though, I would have remembered. Okay, and I'm gonna ask a follow-up question um, and I'm gonna get all these museums. But when I first met you, you were working out of the Carnegie mm -hmm. Museum, which had been the original Carnegie Library. Am I correct? That's correct. And, and that was different from the telephone museum. Yes. So, um, and then you had the Maidu Museum. So can you talk a little, it seems to me that um, Ro Roseville per small area, if you just looked at the town of Roseville, mm -hmm. has an abundance of, they're, they're not just the museums, they're museums you can actually spend time at. Uh, yes. You know, the, the way that they've been curated, the exhibits that are on, um, really engage you. So can you talk a little bit about them? Oh, I'd love why to. People <laughs> should, why people should come to Roseville and, and seek those out. Yes, so uh, Carnegie Museum, of course, the Carnegie Library was built in 1912. And it was <laughs> at one point slated for uh, demolition. They were seriously considering putting a parking lot there or something else. And there were a group of citizens at the time, including Leonard Davis, and this is in the 80s, 82, 83, I believe. And they decided, um, we don't want that to happen. It would make a great museum. The original museum that was going to go into Roseville, um, it was a house that had been a blacksmith shop that had been moved to old Roseville, and it burnt down. Um, it caught fire. So there was no place to house some artifacts and things that they had already begun to collect and they needed a place to do that. So the Carnegie Museum, I'm happy to say when I was there, we completely renovated it. Uh, Leonard Davis, when he passed away, he left us a nice chunk of change. And I took that to mean that they, he wanted us to have a proper archives. And so I began the archives there as well. So upstairs you have this beautiful museum and then downstairs you have a great archives room. And that's the Carnegie. And then you have the Telephone Museum that Mary Ellen is talking about. And that's actually run by the telephone company. Uh, we partnered with them for Museum Saturdays for a long time. Um, I, I believe they are still closed, but that is a fascinating history of telephones in general. And of course, how they made a difference in Roseville. And then the Maidu Museum, which is owned by the city of Roseville, is built on land that was a Maidu settlement. So you have all of the grinding rocks and you have all of the, um, the petroglyphs. And then the museum itself is just amazing with its interpretations and uh, illustrations of how they lived. Now I'll tell you, there's one more that's gonna come on the scene and that's the Roseville Firehouse, the first Roseville Firehouse. So it's gonna be the Roseville Fire Department Museum, I believe. It's a small building. Uh, they were working on it pretty earnestly before the shutdowns. I, I know everything is uh, closed now, but that is slated to come online, I believe in the next year or so. Good. So, and Ruth, <laughs> Ruth has her hand up and um, I'm sure she's going to add some about the Mighty Museum. Oh, so good. Ruth. Ruth, let me turn on, uh, or let me see if I can find you to make sure that you can turn on your. I turned on my sound. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to start your video. You don't have to, to do that, but so go. Yeah, the Maidu Museum has quite a lot of Native American um, displays in it, some very good Native displays. And you mentioned they have the petroglyphs and um, the petroglyphs are, uh, are really phenomenal. I've done, I'm part of the Sacramento Archaeological Society and this it's really worth seeing. Also, they have a gift shop with Native American jewelry. Let me put in a word for that. I, I never buy jewelry. Never. <clears throat> you who know me <laughs> know that's a big lie. <laughs> but they used to have a lot of events. They had a lot of cultural events, um, art type events uh, where you could buy things. Um, they 
cut back the staff a little bit so they don't quite have as many events. Well, right now they aren't having any, but at the point of the pandemic, they weren't having quite as many events, but they're definitely worth a look-see. So. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Do you know Do when you, they'll open again? Open up again? No, they're, they're I, I open. They're open. I, okay. Yeah, I, I just went there less than two weeks ago. Yay. You Good. do have to make an appointment for a tour. And uh, uh, Anne, uh, we might ask you a couple of uh, questions, Anne, for this one. She said you're, uh, you're looking for information on your great-great-grandfather who came out from Arkansas for the gold rush. Any advice on how to research? I'm going to ask a question of you. Do you know that he came to Roseville? Or are you asking about general how to research gold rush history? Well, um, kind of both, uh, Mary okay. Ellen. Um, I understand that he stayed at um, a, a place called Green Valley, which I know is El Dorado County. Uh -huh. But I also, I all, well, in El Dorado County, um, courthouse burned down. So all of those records are gone. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm trying to piece together some research from that era uh, that might, you know, might pertain to that area or related to that area or whatever. And Christina, do you want to answer that one? And then if there are other historians in the group, we can mm -hmm. chime in. Yes. And first of all, good for you for digging into your ancestry. You won't be sorry. Um, I will <laughs> tell you that once you start, you probably won't stop. Oh, God. <laughs> it's addictive for sure. <laughs> good. You've got the bug. Um, so it's going to be important a couple of things. Full name, birth and death date is uh, also very helpful. Mm -hmm. Knowing if this person was a landowner or not is very important. And if uh, he was part of any particular mines that actually made some money. So you're right, El Dorado and Placer, the two main areas for the gold rush. I know in the archives in Placer County where I work, we have a lot of information. There's a lot online as well. Um, I'm gonna, you know what? I'm going to give you my email in the chat, Anne, and we can chat offline about this because I don't want you to ever give up. <laughs> and, <laughs> and find that history and find that story and write about it. And, and the, um, the other thing is that, that I will add to it is the El Dorado Historical Society uh, even though a lot of those records are uh, done, a lot of the historical society and then the Placer County archives. Now, are you working for the archives, Christina? Yes, that's exactly where I, I reside is in the, okay, the archives, archives themselves of, uh, you know, being able to find people that can go that kind of extra mile. Mm -hmm. I hate for anybody to pay for it. Um, right. I know that the Sacramento Public Library has newspapers.com that when you go into a library, you get it for free access. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a trick, however, and that is that um, oftentimes there's optical character recognition. So it'll say you have to pay for it, but if you're willing to skim, you can find information. Putting that into newspapers, because if you've got the name, you know, just check it, checking uh, the newspapers at the time, archive.org. In fact, um, I don't know if Mary and Kyle is on this. I, I'm thinking that one of the little things like uh, I say no to everything, at some point it would be wonderful to kind of come up with a simple how to do this simple research for uh, archives, uh, genealogical groups that are around that are willing to do some of the work. There's free pages. We can go on and on. With, with how you can um, you know, take a, a look. But I always try to find if there's somebody like Christina willing to take your number and say, let me help you search, I don't wanna give up for it. And uh, the other is Google Books and Google News. Uh, if they're, yeah. Google Books, Google Books has transcribed thousands of books um, and diaries and things from the gold rush. Mm -hmm. And so if he's ever mentioned in somebody's diary, wrote a diary himself, then oftentimes that information uh, comes up. It's a hard slog, but it is a worthwhile slog um, to go through it. And what you find is a lot of other information literally along the way. So um, 
I, I'm going to say for Kathy, Kathy, maybe that'll be one of our bits and pieces in okay. the in, in the fall. I was going to do one on how to do your house history. Maybe we'll do how to do your family history. Okay, sounds good. Dead. We've got two more chats here. Janice okay. um, shared that Carnegie Museum is open now with COVID distancing, according to the internet, but she's not been there. And then Ellen says that she believes native remains were found when Roseville Square mm -hmm. was developed. Any comment? Yes, I can confirm that. Uh, there was actually a Native American burial ground there and they reportedly reinterred all of those remains into the, um, the I think it was the Odd Fellows Cemetery is what it was called at the time. But anyway, the Roseville Cemetery. Um, as far as anything else, no doubt there were other things, but as we know at the time when development happened, we didn't, we weren't as careful and we didn't care as much. So Roseville Square would probably look totally different today if they were going to be excavating it. But yes, I can confirm that for sure. Good. And I have another question. <laughs> <laughs> comment <laughs> and that was when i was a, a kid growing up in uh, the 50s and everybody's heard of this story we used to go to jim denio's auction i'm not going to talk about the uh, the auction because it's not part of it, but i'm going to talk about the route when i was a kid that was pre-80 and 50 and how you got to roseville was you went down 16th mm -hmm. street which was the old lincoln highway went up right Auburn, you went uh, up almost city roads, went past Antelope, went in the back way. Uh, and it seems to me that I started in Roseville maybe in 1956 and 20 years later, it didn't seem like it had changed much other than that there was a freeway. So I'm gonna, it, it still seems small and insular. What, what do you think was the impetus for this really explosive growth? Technology. Okay. Yeah, technology was. So we, um, Roseville's at 135,000 now, and it just exploded in the last 30 years because of all of the uh, new technology, the jobs, everything brought to the area. And of course, Sacramento has grown, the Bay Area has grown, and Roseville has just become the darling, right, of the place, the bedroom community. We have great school system. Everything here works for people just trying to make a living and and have a good life. So technology was initially what set it off though. And, and then another question, uh, and this is just one of the reasons I was so excited that you were gonna do this talk is that those of us that are here get very Sacramento County centric. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at all the other cities, Rockland, Penryn, Newcastle, Roseville, um, Auburn, Lincoln, you know, that whole thing, how connected were they or were they just very, separate was each community really its own community with its own history or was there as much um interaction even you though know, that's, a, that's a great question so the communities themselves were within themselves as far as churches as far as schools but these farmers and these ranchers they had to communicate with each other especially when they were shipping goods uh, I'm certain that they came to Roseville and did a lot of trading. I know that a lot of people went into Auburn. Um, it was its county seat, taxes, that sort of thing. Uh, Lincoln was actually bigger than Roseville for a long time. Uh, and Gliding McBean was there. Uh, I would say that they didn't necessarily commune with each other because they did have their own churches and schools and their own communities, but the business people definitely dealt with each other. Good. Uh, so are there uh, other questions that people would like to ask before I hand it over a little to, um, to Kathy and then we'll come back to Christina. Anyone else wanna add anything or ask a question? Oh, and thank you, Chris Berger, for the clarification on the assembly. And then there was another one in here, and Chris again. And thank you. Yes. So Cora was a three-term person and lost her fourth term. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Uh, that was a direct message to me. So. Okay, great. Chris. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, we always have you uh, uh, close out, but I'm going to ask Kathy to come on and, and do our little plugs. 
Thank you, Mary Ellen. I just want everyone to know I put into chat, we've got one more wonderful lecture that we anticipate will be wonderful. It's Dining on the Rails, Tuesday, May 18th at 7. And I went ahead and put in the chat the link to the Eventbrite registration. I've also put in our link the Renaissance Cafe YouTube channel. If you haven't looked at the YouTube channel, all of our, um, our events that have been open to the public have been posted on our YouTube channel. Any that we could post that the host was okay with us posting. So we have, well, we have over 20. I'm not sure exactly how many, but I know it's over 20. And I just wanted to make sure that anyone who is not a Renaissance member gets a chance to um, maybe learn more about Renaissance. Renaissance is all about connecting and learning and then sharing with others. So it is um, very worthwhile. We're in Sacramento, but everything, all of our classes right now since last March um, have been virtual, so anyone can join and still be a big part of that. The last thing I'm going to enter into chat is an invitation for those of you who might want to learn a little bit more about, well, what else could we do? And I'm calling it the Greater Sacramento Area. This is with one of our partner or our community organizations called Friendship Force of Sacramento. We're having a presentation May 23rd at three o'clock where I think we've got four presenters. It'll be about 45 minutes. And we're gonna go, I think down to Oakland, over to Stockton and Modesto, up a bit in Sacramento, into Folsom, mm -hmm. and then out to Calaveras County. So we've got lots of wonderful, wonderful day trips. Um, I, there is going to be an emphasis on some cross-cultural things to do, so I'm hoping that there might be some things you've never thought to do before, but that is the link um, in the chat to the uh, registration site, and then if you're interested in any more information, I did put the website, or you could just Google Friendship Force of Sacramento, so that is our little plug. And back to you, Mary Ellen, to close. Thank you so much. And um, I, I'm going to go back to Christina. Uh, I do have kind of one question. I have to say that I have been dreaming about, wouldn't it be wonderful for us to take a train trip to just Roseville from our Amtrak station? Mm -hmm. Because it does go there. I don't know if it comes back every day. <laughs> um, but if we did decide, we do have something called a Cook's Tour of Sacramento. Cook's Tour is our ability to get, um, you know, uh, uh, out and about when we can and to travel within, usually within 60 miles of Sacramento. Would you consider if we could get ourselves to Roseville either by train or by a car that maybe we could do uh, even a walking tour of Vernon Street? And that's where two of the museums are. Am I correct? Yeah, well, we have the Telephone gallery. Museum on Vernon Street and Blue Line Gallery right. and wonderful places to eat. And I'd be honored, Mary Ellen. Um, I do that with Sun City and it's just, it's fun. It's a, it will be a good day to do that, yes. Great, good. So, and I'm now I'm going to, before we close up, if there's anything you'd like to do for closing remarks. I would, first of all, thank you everyone. Um, I do tend to give shorter presentations versus longer because I love the interaction at the end because then you can dig into what you wanna dig into. Again, it's making us appreciate our community even more with our history knowledge. And I'm gonna give a little plug for Sacramento Historical Society. Uh, this is new news, Mary Ellen. Uh, we have a May 25th presentation on Theodore Judah. And he was of course a mastermind behind all the railroads out here, the original railroads. And we got clearance from the county to do a limited in-person meeting at the Knights of Columbus Hall. So it'll be about a 35% capacity. Uh, we'll be doing a hybrid model, both Zoom and in-person. If you're interested in that, uh, 
pop into Sacramento Historical Society's website. And we do presentations every month. Uh, we take off July and August, but we do wonderful history presentations every single month. So if you're interested, May 25th, Theodore Judah. It's, it, Chuck Spinks is our speaker. Boy, he's amazing. He's an engineer himself, and he's a very good speaker. Thank you again. I appreciate it, Mary Ellen. Great. And Christina, thank you so much. And I'll put a plug in for the Historical Society. I was on the board, thank God Christina uh, came in so that I didn't have to. Uh, but wonderful, wonderful talks. If you look at your membership and our membership, you're going to find that half your membership is Renaissance members anyway. Yes. So please look them up and join. I want to thank Kathy Hart. Uh, uh, again, Kathy, thank you so much for being the, the tech host and helping out with this. And uh, we did get one more question. Is the Judah presentation on the 25th in the evening? If I am correct, they're usually at seven o'clock. Uh, um, we moved them to 6.30. Yes. 6.30. And yes. there is, um, um, there is, we will make sure when we're sending out information that you all have a link to that because uh, it will be limited most likely to members for that 35%. That's what I'm assuming. Yes. Uh, but the Zooms, um, you can join. Uh, it's just a, a small fee if you're a non-member. So $5. Christina, $5. So Christina, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, ask Kathy to um, um, just stop the recording. And then if all of you will stay 